The Willamette Falls Locks has kind of been my specialty for the last 20 years because its authorization was strictly commercial tonnage under some very ancient definitions of com commercial tonnage. And consequently, the last 20 years, its appropriations from Congress have gone down, 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 down. But when it was built and opened on January 1st, 1873, it was the first significant navigational improvement on the Columbia Snake drainage. And that's what you're looking at here in the green. I don't know how well it, how well it looks to you, but it's the snake in Columbia and the Willamette, which is in Oregon and and uh, flows south to north, joining the Columbia at Portland. So today, this is what the a drone picture. Now, I'm not an engineer. I've been documenting stuff at the locks for the last 20 years as an advocate, and they've been letting me take a lot of pictures and going a lot of places that people don't normally get to go, so I'm a very lucky person. So this is looking north, northeast, above the locks. It's a four-lift tandem lifts each about 10 to 12 feet, depending on water levels and stuff. And it gets you around Willamette Falls, which are about a 45 foot basalt cascade. And the structures to the right side of the locks in this picture, that is a paper mill. It's been there since under different ownerships and with new you know, te technological upgrades since about 1890. 1889. So it's four tandem lifts, each lift from the lower river, which is what you're looking at. Each chamber is 40 wide by 210. So all of the barge and river traffic that used this from its opening in 1873, they had to build the steamboats and everything just to fit through this. And it was a low draft, like three foot draft. So today, if you look at the big barges on the Columbia River, they're ginormous, but they had to have a special fleet of vessels that would be able to work the marine businesses through this 40 foot wide canal from the upper river to the lower and back again. So looking straight down on it, it's one of my favorite views on a quiet night in 2005. This is looking upriver. So now you can see the upper river and a portion of the falls, which is a big horseshoe shaped structure that ends sort of straight out from that stack there. So the canal basin is where much of the mills traffic on and off loaded in the old days when they were shipping through the canal all the time and keeping it nice and busy with commercial tonnage. This is just the cover of a brochure printed in 1998. So, you know, it's like 25 years ago, the, the locks had its 125th anniversary and people celebrated. The image shows Moore's Island where all of those mill buildings are now on the east side of the lock canal. And it was a city called Lynn City in the 1850s. In 1862, it was completely obliterated by the big flood of 1862. This river has had some massive floods. So the picture is taken in between in sort of a restful time before the mills and power plants started up in the 1880s. This would be 1894. We now have long distance transmission of power happened across the river in 1889, the first one, 13 miles to Portland over the wires. So the LOX is booming and it's a big messy industrial site. And of course we were logging old growth forests throughout the life of the LOX until people couldn't do it anymore. So the rivers were covered with log rafts. And I love this picture because you can see a small child right in the middle there that wouldn't really work with today's workplace safety regulations. This takes us to the log hall from the upper river. You may be able to see some rafts in the upper right making their way to the sawmill portion of the mill, which hasn't operated for quite a long time. And the lower center right, you can see the first gate, which is essentially the extension of the dam around the falls. The FERC dam actually runs in the walls of these mill, old mill buildings and then out around the horseshoe shape. So there's a little tugboat uh, either just coming out or waiting to get 
in in 51. So to jump back, in the early part of the 20th century, the, there were so many log jams on the river and it was such a busy place. And the railroads were coming in and making the, the actual tolling at the locks because it was built by a private company, making the tolling not as profitable. So the, the Corps was talking about punching a new lock in Oregon City, which is just across the falls, and they had two proposed routes that would have obliterated all the industry downtown. So that didn't fly. The Corps of Engineers bought the locks in 1915. And that shows their 1916 renovation. There's some lovely little workers down in the bottom by the little railroad tracks. And you get a look at one of the sills. They were deepening it to a six foot uh, draft. And in 1941, after the, or just before the war, they did a renovation on it, but they didn't get to do what they originally wanted to do, which was to turn it into one 47 foot lift. They couldn't work out the engineering problems. And I know this because my grandfather was the head civilian engineer for the Portland District Army Engineers. And I didn't find out till 40 years after he died that he had been in charge of the locks, actually. And you can see some men standing on the sill. They've got the they're replacing the wooden original wooden lock gates with metal gates, but the metal is the steel waffle structure inside. They are still clad with planks on the downstream side and some sort of cladding on the upstream, which I don't know what it is. So this is just a little diagram of what existed in the old days when the mills were going full bore. On the right is the upriver entrance to the locks, and you just see the guard lock, which doesn't, there's no lift involved with the guard lock. It's just there to protect the river level should the anything fail with the main gate. So it shows the different parts of the mill and stuff. I just think that's kind of fun to, to look back at that process. So as the commercial tra traffic dropped, occasionally we'd still get really good big cargoes that really couldn't be moved by highway and under underpasses. So the Spruce Goose on its way from California to McMinnville Air Museum in 93 was taken apart and put through this little locks and somehow it worked, but it was gigantic. And luckily it wasn't more than 40 feet wide, but it was too long to go one lift at a time and they had it stuck out over the second chamber. And so they had to kind of do it a little differently. Other things that happen, there's lots of piers and docks on this river above and below the falls. So there are marine industries that maintained, you know, the piers and the docks and moorages and stuff. And the, this, as I said, this fleet of equipment that just fits through this canal. We started having celebrations of the canal to try to draw people's attention to it in the early 2000s because the appropriations were dropping off really badly. And I encouraged the tugboat friends of ours to bring some steel, scrap steel on a barge through to show people what a real commercial cargo could look like. But they closed the locks in 2011. I do have a couple more. Yeah, this is, this is kind of what the locks was moving towards just because of the changing economy of the Willamette Valley. So there were lots of recreational activities there in the summertime and it was kind of dead in the winter except for occasional crane equipment. I like this picture of the skulls up above on one lift and the, the first gate there just letting that big water fall out. One of the reasons they couldn't do the big 46 foot single lift really wide would have wiped out the power plant and the mill and everything else. But the, the main reason they couldn't make it work is because they were trying to do the modern idea of the underwater below the chamber valves and it was just too problematic. So I found that information in my grandfather's papers. So this is a good look at a sill when it was really peaceful in the summer, the water's low. You can see the, see the old gate there. Now the gates, because they were owned by the Corps of Engineers, have standard mandatory every five year or 10 year inspections that have to be done. And I just wanted to show this picture of the tools that they have to use. Look at the life jacket. That's an adult life jacket. And those nuts, you could probably slip them over an adult man's arm. They're just giant tools. And it takes several people to use this wrench when they're trying to actually dismantle the gates for a gates inspection in 2009. 
and they moved the equipment in and that's Captain Tim with the crane getting ready to pull those gates off. But it is a lot of work to get them off. They had to go out and attach the gear and undo the hydraulics that came in in the 50s. Before that, they were all, of course, manually turned. This shows where the first gate would have set. A whole knit, a notch in that wall there. And you can sort of see where old, old work on the walls has resulted in this kind of artistic patchwork with some of the basalt ashlar masonry left there, and but mostly planking. So again, the gates are pulled out. You can kind of see more than one sill there. And you can see the waterfall coming out of that upper gate because it's holding the river back. Because this is a bypass canal, which are relatively rare. And so the water that's diverted from the river next to the bank up there is what runs the locks rather than weirs or canals. And it, it has a temper. Sometimes it floods, sometimes it's low, sometimes it silts things up, but it's worked really well for almost 150 years. So then they carry this gate. If this is the first gate, it weighed 65,000 pounds. I was looking at the scale when they picked it up, soaking wet, and they carefully take it out. Those guys in the fishing boat didn't want to move, but they had to. And then they turned sideways because the weight was such that it would have tipped the barge if they took it over the side. So they turned and, and put it on front ways to the repair barge, laid it down, it got fixed. The smaller gates, they laid a couple of them in the park right along the canal. And you can kind of see the inter interior there where they're checking that out on the inspection. We have some great drawings that show basically how they were built, what the parts are. You know, there's pentels and coins and wicket gates and all that kind of stuff. So it's really fun to look at these old drawings, but I just put in one. Then they're putting the cladding back on and cleaning it up before they rehang this this pair of gate leaves. Now, the problem that's kept it shut now is that they don't have any money because they don't have any commerce and they want to offload the locks because they are suspicious that the gudgeon arms and anchors, which is you're looking at one part of one gate's gudgeon anchor system. Most of them are buried in rock or concrete. They're all serviced at different times. This is another one. You can see the corrosion on the exterior parts. And they're very worried about metal fracture in which case the coin might gently fall into a chamber during a lift and hurt somebody. But every single gate, you've got four lifts and then the guard lock, so you've got a lot of gates and they at different times have been fixed and so they all have different engineering as to how they're connected to the bank and stuff. This is the top of the coin when they're trying to figure out how to remove this one because it's kind of under some metal grating by the guard shack. So I just wanted to show the variety of connections that had to be worked out when people were working on this over the years. That's actually the interior, I'll call it, where that gate, that's where it meets its partner when it closes. And, and it, it's a Leonardo da Vinci upstream pointing design that makes it not necessary to exert any human force to keep the gate closed because the water weight does it. And there it is locked with its neighbor. And here are the guys working on it, trying to, you know, get the hydraulics back on again or off. I don't know which, but this is one of the shorter gates. Very oily hands. Oh, some of those bolts and things have been on there for so long. They are really, really hard to get off. And it's amazing to see what a little tug on a rope or somebody with their foot can do to move this massive amount of weight into the right position because it's not connected to anything at the bottom. It just sits in the pintle, pintle bearing. And when they took them apart for the inspection and repairs and took all the boards off, they numbered them so they could put them back together where they were, which I thought was really fun. And some of the boards were not in good shape. So they actually replaced them with what I call plastic lumber. And here we have somebody again, it, it's a good look down at the shape of the sill uh, as they try to uh, maneuver that towards the pintle bearing so they can slip that back in. The equipment is old. I think it's terribly cute bright colors, the old control panels for the operators that swing the gates. 
you can see number four and number five with little arrows. It sort of looks 50s to me, I don't really know. And the technology here, you can see closed circuit TV, a princess phone, probably some kind of walkie talkie and an analog clock. And they had two operator stations. One basically was close to the downriver entrance, one to the upriver, because it's kind of a dog leg. The lock master would be in the middle in a two story bu building that's now the museum barking out orders. This is just a, a shot. Oh, I'm sorry it doesn't show the screen, but today, uh, one of the things they need to do is get ground penetrating radar really to inspect the things that are buried if they don't wanna rip them, actually physically rip it out. And they brought in a submersible remote control robot to check out the pentals and different things in there. And everybody's fascinated to watch the thing underwater. So the LOX is trying to move into the you know 20th century as far as getting it repaired. And I guess that is, I've got so much more. I am an appointee to the state's Willamette Falls Locks Authority, a newly created public corporation that we are going to try to get it repaired, reopened, and serving the people of Oregon again pretty quick. Whew.